Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton relief efforts. I'm just going to go around and uh, introduce the people that we have on the call. First, we have uh, Mary Jane Thompson. She is our executive director for the American Red Cross Northwest Wisconsin chapter based in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Uh, then we have uh, Laura McGuire. She's our regional communications manager um, and she's based in Madison, Wisconsin. Then we have Rebecca Rockhill. Um, she's the executive director of our American Red Cross Northeast Wisconsin chapter based in Green Bay. And Rebecca is currently deployed to North Carolina, helping out with Hurricane Helene relief efforts. And then we have Jane Nesbitt. She is an American Red Cross uh, volunteer, and she's currently deployed to Florida to help out with Hurricane Milton relief efforts. Now I'd like to turn it over to Mary Jane or MJ. Uh, for a brief recap of the Red Cross hurricane relief efforts to date. MJ? Thank you, Jen, and thank you everyone for joining us today uh, to give you uh, the most up-to-date status. Across the Southeast, nearly 2,000 American Red Cross responders are helping as people come to grips with the immense losses from Hurricanes Milton and Helene. Uh, the Red Cross of Wisconsin has a total of 58 responders deployed to Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton relief efforts. Here's the breakdown of where those volunteers are deployed. We have 37 volunteers deployed to Florida. Two are deployed to Georgia. 17 are deploy deployed in the Carolinas, two in Tennessee. And we have three emergency response vehicles from our region, uh, from Madison, Green Bay, and Milwaukee. Uh, they are deployed to help with feeding, and each of those have a team of two. We have two of our emergency response vehicles at Red Cross, we call them ERVs, uh, and two are in Florida, one is in Tennessee. Red Crossers, alongside our partners, are providing food, shelter, supplies, and a shoulder to lean on in Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Tennessee. Tuesday night, more than 2,000 people were still staying in emergency shelters across those affected states. We encourage anyone who needs aid to come to a shelter, and it's important to know that they do not have to stay overnight to receive help. Disaster kitchens are up and running, and dozens of those ERVs, the emergency response vehicles from Red Cross, are on the roads delivering those hot meals along with water and supplies to people struggling to clean their homes. With the help of our partners, we provided some 2.3 million snacks and meals and some 69,000 relief items, such as cleaning and hygiene supplies, and those are for thousands of those affected across the five states. In many areas, Red Cross damage assessment teams are working with partners to detail the scope of the destruction. This critical information will be used to make plans for what support uh, we can provide, including financial assistance, and families may be needing those in the many weeks and months ahead. We've received more than 11,500 inquiries about missing loved ones. Uh, Red Cross and our unif reunification teams are working nonstop to help. Redcross.org slash Helene. The work isn't close to being done. Red Cross is there, will be there to support those in need as they recover in the weeks and the months to come. And many people will ask how they can help. Uh, people need support now and we can't do this alone. Please help by making a financial donation, an appointment to give blood or platelets, or signing up to become a volunteer by visiting redcross.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS. That's 800-733-2767. So financial donations can help people affected by the hurricanes uh, and enable these enable Red Cross to help prepare for, respond to, and help people recover from these disasters. You can also text the word hurricanes to 90999 to make a donation. And blood donors, thanks to the generosity of our blood donors in unimpacted areas of the country, the Red Cross was able to ensure life-saving blood products were available to patients ahead of these storms. Those outside of affected areas are encouraged to continue to give blood and platelets now. You can give blood every 56 days uh, and platelets uh, you can give more often. And remember that hurricane season isn't over. If people want to make a difference in the lives of others, please consider volunteering, putting on a red vest and joining us. 
And now I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca Rockhill, who is on the ground in Asheville, and she is my counterpart in the Green Bay Northeast chapter of the Red Cross. Rebecca, please share with us uh, what you're seeing in your service. Sure. Good morning, all. Um, I am based, as MJ referenced, in the northwest corner of North Carolina. Really, I'm up in the Blue Ridge and Smoky Mountains region. And my official role here is as an elected official liaison or an EOL. Um, and an EOL's role is really to correspond and keep communications clear with all of the elected officials within our um, counties area. So we're assigned a certain number of counties and we correspond with those elected officials every single day. This allows us to keep the communication clear, let them know what we're doing, what we're seeing, um, what might be some new issues coming up. It also allows them to share with us new pockets that they've identified as need, things that they're hearing from their constituents or their community. It also has proven to be a really great way to um, quelch any rumors that come up or be able to provide clarity around services and form some great partnerships with not only the government, but area nonprofits and businesses. Um, the resiliency and the cooperation that we see in these, these communities is really something that I've never experienced before. Just neighbors helping neighbors and people responding to anyone who is in need. Um, it's really quite incredible. Um, we are operating a number of shelters as was referenced. Um, also coordinating community care spaces and that is just um, places where there are provisions of showers, laundry facilities, charging stations, free Wi-Fi, um, hot meals, as well as shelf-stable meals that people can take home in order to be able to um, have food when they can't get down into these areas. However, our roles often change. Uh, one of the things I was told before coming to deployment was flexibility and patience is the most important thing. And so quite often we're asked to do some things that might be outside of our EOL range. And given the enormous threat of this disaster of these tropical storms and hurricanes, we also spend a great deal of time driving through the mountains finding homes or often neighborhoods that have yet to be identified, um, great pockets of need of individuals who simply have not received resources, even almost three weeks after the storm, still are without power, still are without water. And finding these individuals gives us a spot to identify them so they can be assessed and begin to receive um, some disaster relief through our services, as well as some of those basic needs. Um, many of these homes high in the mountains, they just um, don't have those simple things as I referenced. And so many of them don't want to leave their areas. And we are experiencing an unusual cold snap here and the weather last night actually dipped down into the 20s up in these high mountain regions. And many choose to stay in tents by their homes, wanting to stay on their land. We see images of homes that are completely destroyed with the tents next to them. So it's important that we are going up and providing for the needs, some basic needs. We've brought in generators and propane heaters and again, warm weather gear. And oftentimes, we partner with community members who have these UTVs. We can't get up into those areas. And so we bring them to the partners with UTVs and they drive them up into the mountains where they're inaccessible. Um, yesterday, we saw an amazing thing happen in Yancey, North Carolina. There are neighborhoods that are completely inaccessible. 
even with UTVs, they just can't be reached. Through a great Red Cross initiative that was began through this called Operation Mountain Hope, we were able to deliver sleeping bags and tents and those generators and all the things I referenced earlier to a site where the National Guard loaded these supplies into helicopters and brought them up and dropped them into some of these mountaintop areas that were completely unaccessible and maybe for months. So we are really working around the clock to make sure that so many of these individuals and so many of these people affected by the storms are being identified and we're making sure that the Red Cross continues to meet those needs through the work of many of our partners. Um, and it's been immensely rewarding to be here and be a part of these efforts. It just, I'm so proud to be a Red Crosser right now. Thank you, Rebecca, for sharing. And I know there may be some questions in a few minutes, but at this time, uh, your counterpart in Wisconsin, our community volunteer leader, Jane Nesbitt, we're grateful that you're here. You're at your home in Florida, and you also live in Sturgeon Bay and serve the Red Cross in many ways. Uh, but very importantly, and what we value so much from you, Jane, is your health coordination and supervision as an RN on deployments for Red Cross. Jane, would you share about your deployment to Florida before and after Hurricane Milton? Yes. Um, this was my first time that I deployed pre landfall. So we were uh, sent over to what was um, a high school that was established as the first shelter. And at the time that we got there, um, the school, the, the principal and his staff were intaking people identifying, you know, na their names, giving them wristbands, that type of thing, and getting them into classrooms to be um, where they would be staying. Um, then when about that was on a Monday, and then by Tuesday, we were getting warned that the the Milton was getting closer and that um, shortly that we would be called uh, onto a, what they call a ground stop, which nobody would be able to leave their rooms. There was um, 1800 people registered at this, at this high school. Amongst other things, we had multiple uh, pets and animals of all sorts. So, we were on ground stop for a little over 24 hours. At that time, we delivered, and an evac shelter is de delegated as feeding and a roof over their heads. There's really, we are not getting into the long-term situation as far as trying to place or, or that. It's place people. Um, an evac shelter is keeping them safe while the hurricane uh, went over us. So um, then after the ground stop was lifted, uh, the cafeteria staff, which was amazing, was able to start feeding them hot meals again because initially we were giving, when we were on ground stop, we were feeding um, meals going from room to room and just uh, giving them the packaged meals that the kitchen had had prepared for them. So again, we accomplished the feeding and the sheltering as Hurricane Milton started to approach and um, we knew that they it was close, close to coming over us. So uh, we stayed at that shelter high school for until for four days and then we had to move to another high school so a lot of people were bused back to their homes to evaluate if they were their homes were livable um, so into the next shelter um, was another high school we our census came down to 360 um, 
we were no we were off of ground stop we were still considered an evac shelter so it was basically feeding and keeping them you know warm and safe um so we were there for two nights and then on we moved again um <laughs> we had the, we had a we had a high census of clientele that were in elderly in um, wheelchairs, walkers, and canes. Um, we had a high census of also um, people that were uh, that needed their psych meds. They were had been off of their psych meds, so we really had kind of two different types of clientele. Um, and so from River Ridge High School, again, we stayed there two nights and um, they were able to move out people um, to their homes as they could by a school bus by, and loaded wheelchairs and all their belongings. And then we were moved to a shelter called um, Veterans Memorial rec center at that point we we're down to about 130 people that is where the team the people that took over or my people that took over for me my supervisor i am i am dhs um and there was one other dhs person there with me from the 1800 census shelter to um, now down to the one that is at 130. Uh, at Veterans Memorial now, um, FEMA and social workers have started to come in. We are able to gather clients together and start um, getting their medications back that they need. Um, we have now stepped, taken the next step forward where we're able to start getting them um, they're safe now. We're starting to able. We're starting to get them back to where, just getting them the supplies that they need. And then, um, if they can move on, we also had a large amount of homeless people. So that was a, has also been a challenge as far as when um, the social workers started to come in to try to find places for the homeless people also. Um, I have to say that our accommodations for the shelters um, were very difficult for the clients. When you're in a high school, you really don't have a lot of elevators. So you have people in the classrooms on a second and third floor. And um, there were a couple of elevators of which people um, could uh, be moved around. And then when we would be feeding, they needed a lot of assistance just moving around in the cafeteria. So at this point, um, we're making, I believe, a little bit of progress in the Veterans Rec Center as FEMA came in, um, some county social services came in, and they were having the people sign up and they were starting to make cases for each of them. And we as the Red Cross people were feeding. Um, we got, um, Cracker Barrel was amazing. We ended up having two herbs come full of Cracker Barrel food and other supplies. Um, once we got to the veterans, which would have been five days into um, our, well, and into our third move. Um, and so then we started getting also supplies as far as, you know, cleaning supplies and, and um, but the, major, the majority of the time, especially when we were at the second high school, it was not a shelter that had cots. These people were a lot of them were sleeping on piles of blankets. If we could go out and get blankets, um, there were some people that were able to bring along. They were 
advised to bring along anything they had to sleep on. So where there were blow up mattresses, but when you're talking about, you know, 1800 people and, and some that were not capable of managing this, we um, did what we could to get them, keep them safe and comfortable and fed. Thank you, Jane. Um, now I would like to open the floor uh, for questions. If anybody has questions for Rebecca, Jane, MJ, uh, or myself or Laura. Um, we will be putting together uh, the recording from this and sending it out along with um, some B-roll footage and the latest photos that we have after uh, this press briefing wraps up. So you'll all receive emails with that information. If I am also able to ask all the stations to put in the chat um, where you are calling in from, I see there's a number of reporters and some mystery numbers um, that would really help us to identify um, who is all on the call. Thank you. All right, well, if, oh, I'm sorry, do you have a question? Um, yes, thank you so much. I was wondering if, if there's still time. Oh, sure, yes. Great, um, yes, I was just wondering what has been different and challenging about this scenario, um, in not only in the Carolinas where we heard about that cold snap that's happening, but you also have those mountains that add to the difficulty of the situation. But in Florida, two hurricanes coming in back to back. How has that challenged relief efforts in both of those areas? Well, I'll go ahead and go first, Jane. Um, I can say that it is so widespread um, the damage that's done so it, it's not really focusing on a particular area and as the mountains are involved and so many different pockets it's difficult to find so many affected areas to really be able to identify those who need the most help the fact that so many roads are washed out, um, communication has been very difficult and some areas won't have that communication for months. And so identifying where and who needs the help um, and really a long distance to travel for many to get down into areas that may have these community care centers or knowing even when Jane referenced the herbs, the emergency response vehicles that are bringing food out to homes that can't get into the feeding area. Um, even knowing what routes to take and, and where those pockets are that might need food, I think that's that's one of the biggest challenges that we see here. Jane, and if I may answer that, um, and I. Own, I'm not sure if this is just DHS or this was when I was speaking to my DHS supervisor, 85% of the people that have deployed to this are first time deployment. Mm -hmm. This is their first time deployment. Now this, you know, you're talking such a huge um, impact on so many regions that um, to have 85% of the people being new volunteers, that these are their first deployments, that's very overwhelming to them. Also, the local news, um, from what I heard last night, is that in Florida, we have a thousand people on the ground from Florida. When you think about a thousand people, and I'm sure they're probably not counting people that have come in from other, um, from you know Wisconsin, from other states. So I don't know the total of number there, but um, 
to get volunteers to get staff, people to staff and, and come and become a Red Cross volunteer is such an emphasis that needs to be um, pushed as I believe in in our re regions. Yeah, I will I will just um, echo what Jane um, just said. Um, we're stretched thin, you know, I mean, when you have two hurricanes back to back, um, you know, we have all of our people out right now. Um, that's why, you know, we keep saying if you want to help, one of the ways you can do so is put on a red vest. Uh, we need volunteers. So I just want to add one more thing. Um, my husband, we, my husband stayed at our home. Um, we are down in West Palm Beach. And I don't know if you all heard about the tornado barrage that happened north of us, which which would be on the east coast of Florida, that within a couple of hours, they were confirming a hundred and some tornadoes that touched down. Now on my ride back to our home, I, I was directed by my GPS um, over to the areas of Vero Beach, Stewart, um, Martin County, where all the hurricanes touch down. So um, there is mass damage and um, disaster needs over in the Eastern portion of Florida from the tornadoes that all came through when the hurricanes came through. So it's, it was not only the hurricanes, but the amount of damage in the amount in the area, the widespread area that, that caused you know, destruction of homes and that in Florida, in mid, probably I would say the mid region of Florida on the East Coast is another area where a red, where red Cross has, is just busy, busy trying to help out those people also. What we're hearing a lot too is from a lot of the residents is don't forget about us. I mean, you know, it's sort of this something happens and there's this large gathering of philanthropic folks and um, response and everyone sort of gathers around and then the attention tends to, to die off um, when recovery and rebuilding and restoring is going to take months, probably years for many folks and the Red Cross will be coming in uh, with a long-term recovery program in most of these communities but our families and those affected are going to need help for a very long time so when Jen and Jane talk about the need for volunteers it's not just now it will be continuing not only for right here Helene and Milton but as we continue to see more and more disasters through climate change. Yes, and I, I don't know, and um, I noticed in one of the questions where they're asking about the staffing, um, the Red Cross staff, some are staying in shelters, some are put into hotels and um, multiple hotels are just comping the Red Cross stays that are there. So there is no um, no cost as far as to Red Cross as far as people staying in these hotels because these hotels are comping out um, all of our, our costs. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions at this time? I just had um, a quick question, just um, real briefly, and you guys might have um, already said it, so I apologize if I missed it, but how many people in those affected regions are still without power? I don't I really, oh, sorry, everybody. No, go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah, 
I was just going to say it's really difficult to tell in many of the areas, especially up in the mountain areas, because a lot of times they, they were talking about it just being the rather than the underground lines being above grounds and they're still trying to figure out where and who are affected by these power outages. So we look daily or get a report daily on how many power outages still exist. And we continue to see that number fluctuate. Um, I don't think there's a static number that we can really give, but there are still a lot of power outages and water, um, having running water in Asheville, mm -hmm. um, having access to water from fountain, from sink, is still going to be a long way off. Yeah, I mean, I, I know obviously like it's an ever-changing situation with power can come back on and then it can go out again. But when you say there are a lot of outages still happening, I mean, are you talking like dozens, hundreds, thousands? Like, is there even like a, a, a way that you can maybe ballpark it in some way? I, in my, in our situation down in Florida, um, shortly after Helene hit and then Milton, Milton I was hearing 1.2 million people without power as Florida Power and Light and I'm speaking just for Florida because that's where I was deployed to um, each, each day we do get an update but I would not be surprised if we are still talking in in the lower in the hopefully gotten down into the hundred thousands as opposed to millions. As of right. Tuesday, the Red Cross is um, saying 200,000 people are without power. In, so in all, of the, all of those regions or just Florida? I believe in all the regions. All the region. Okay, thank you so much. Sure, thanks for the question. And then if I could just ask one more question here. Um, so obviously donations are needed financial donations, um, blood and plate and don platelet donations, or putting your hands in and being a volunteer. So if people make these donations, when will their donations of money, blood, or their time with volunteering go into effect? Um, well, I can say that uh, if you donate uh, your time, um, we put volunteers through a training process, so we're not going to just, you know, give you a red vest and send you out there. Um, so it would be, you'd have to go through this uh, training process first, so that would probably take a few weeks. Um, as far as financially, um, some of that is already going into effect, buying different, you know, supplies and needs for um, the people in those communities. And then I think also it's just, um, you know, stepping back to see what is needed in all of those communities that uh, have been affected. So, and I'll just add to Jen's comment. So blood has a shelf life of 56, uh, people can give blood every 56 days and blood has a shelf life of 42 days. We often 